your station better. You're going to be dealing with dangerous voltages at some point, unless you bring in an electrician and whatnot. Particularly if you're fond of vintage radio gear, such as tubes and stuff, you really need to know what's going on there. A lot of the tube gear <laughs> is, uh, is hot, meaning that the, the, one side of the chassis, metal case, is actually connected to one side of the AC. If you grab hold of that and you're standing on uh, a ground, that voltage is going to go through you. I got scars on my hands from that sort of thing. Yeah. I had actually, uh, my situation ended up paralyzed, and the only thing that stopped me was the fact that my body was physically off balance. I fell over and away from the equipment. And mm -hmm. It was a freaky feeling, but yeah. <laughs> I, so six, you... I took 650 volts DC from my arm across my back. The uh, Ethan drives. DC. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh. It's like a sledgehammer. You've got to uh, I mean, I've been, be aware. I've been zapped by an improperly wired plug before. Mm-hmm. Brushing the like just straight electrical socket. Mm. Like so you know what I'm talking about? It, yeah, it hurts. Okay. Also, going to run into situations where you might want to expand your electrical system a little bit. You might want to put in a few extra plugs to service your station. You don't want to pay the price of an electrician. You know, so it, it inevitably you get a little brave, a little bit of knowledge, you know, <laughs> get you in trouble. <laughs> so we need to just step back a bit and understand what we're playing with. And, and if we if we do the we take the right precautions and understand how things are, we should be OK. We should be able to spot a problem before it happens. So basically, we talk a little bit about house wearing. What I want to show you, find it here. Your typical house wiring system. See it here? Yeah. Okay. This one is not bad, but let's not use this one because it's too busy. The one I want is this one. Yes, much better. Okay, so what you need to understand about your house wiring is that you have 220 volts coming into your house. Whether you use it or not, it's still there. So it comes in on three wires. And it comes from a transformer that's on a pole outside your house. These transformers typically service between four to six houses each. So if that transformer blows, four houses lose power. So there are three lines that are coming in. One is essentially the ground, and then the other two are the hots. Notice there are two hots. But if you know about transformers, transformers operate on what kind of current? AC. AC. So is there really a hot and a cold with an AC line? No. Depending on what you grab a hold of, any one of those lines has a voltage on it, whether they call it ground or not. So, you have your three lines coming in. In this case, you have your two black wire and your blue wire. Maybe that fits the code for the, the, those lines. I haven't really looked at a box lately no, to not. see if that's the color code. It's no, not. No, wait. Wait, wait. Okay, anyway, by the, by the time it gets off of the box, that's when it starts changing color from, from a red to whatever we're talking about. But right. I don't know what actually comes in here. You're coming in, now, and you have... Yeah? You have three bits of blue phase, right? Mm -hmm. You're supposed to have black, white, black, white, and usually red coming in. Okay. All right. So what you have here is you have the two hot lines go to two separate bus bars, and they can be paired from the ground line either side to give you 120 volts. Each one will be a be a one phase or the other phase. So they might wire half of your house on one side of the transformer, and the other half on the other. To balance it out, and then it, when you grab the t connect across these two lines, you get your 220 volts. So your dryer and stuff like that would be running the three wires, and it'd be getting its 120, or it would get it get its 240 volts across the red and the black wire. Mm -hmm. But your normal operation would be your 120 volts, which you're most familiar with, and that's where you get your black and your white wire, and your ground wire. 
Now understand this, that ground wire goes all the way to here. Does it look like a ground? No, it's relative. So be aware. So <clears throat> you have your three wires. You have your black, what they call your hot. But again, this is AC, right? So it, this wire can poke you if you get the, if you get the wrong ground on it. So even, that's something to keep in mind. So this third wire, they say, it signals the fuse when there's a when when there's a problem. That's because they take this wire and they wire it right to the chassis of your of your radio. But as soon as one of these wires gets in contact with it, it's going to blow the fuse before you get before you get zapped. But don't forget that is still a potential source of AC. But in the old systems, they don't have this ground wire. All they got is one of these wires is connected to the metal chassis of your old tube radio. And that makes it all the more dangerous. It's usually not the black wire. But old tube radios have how many prongs on the? On the? Two. 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 And how many ways are there to put it in the socket? Anyway. Four. <laughs> <laughs> and did they really bother to make one thicker than the other so they wouldn't fit back then? No. No. So one day you plug it in, hold on to the sink, nothing. Next day you plug it in, wham. <laughs> so got to be careful with that. Uh, recommendation is if, you, if you're working with tube gear, make certain that you're not on a basement floor. If you are on a basement floor, put down a rubber mat. Yeah. Just so that you guys know, you can buy a ground fault detector for a two wire system. Okay, and you can actually you can buy the breaker, it goes in your panel, and then that whole circuit is ground fault detector. Yeah, I'm getting to that. Oh, sorry. Yes, okay. GFIs are the, uh, is your other protection. The other way is an isolation transformer. That's by far Isolation transformer? By far the yes. Safest. Which is basically a one to one transformer that just connects between the two so that there's no direct connection to the system. You can still get a good poke out of it though, but not the one that's, that's going to put you in the box. No. <laughs> so essentially this is what you're dealing with. You're dealing with your, your, your black and your white and your brown. And if you're going to work on this stuff, turn off the power, use a flashlight. I know it's a pain in the butt, but it's even a bigger pain in the butt if you don't. Literally. It, yeah, yeah. Or you might not have finished the day. Yeah. So this is the basic layout that you're that you're gonna get in your in your box. And once you get to circuit level, this is how it works out too. You have your two wires that come up, your black and your white, in this case it has to be gray. And you can see that sometimes they put them in, they put them together so that they come in one side, come out the other, go to the next plug, and so on and so forth. The grounds are all common. You notice how they observe the polarities, they make sure that the, uh, the proper connection of typically these can the uh, your proper AC outlets have one set of screws that's darker than the other. That usually means put the dark black wire on it. And the, and the white one is white wire. And your ground is usually pretty obvious. It should be painted green. Now we were talking about GFI receptacles. It's also a very good idea in a ham shack, especially if you're dealing with tube gear, that you should put in at least one GFI socket in the circuit. A single GFI will protect all the sockets that are connected in series with it. So you don't have to have multiple GFIs. But the GF, GFI will protect you from some other, other, other unforeseen problems. And with tube gear, there's unforeseen problems. The older stuff, particularly if you get down to your 
1940s vintage in that. Those are, are blatantly wired to AC. So, a very good idea to have one of these. Very easy, they're inexpensive, they're very easy to install. Basically all you do is go to um, ideally the first the first socket in the certain in the series and just replace your AC socket with one of these. And everything's protected. Again, here's just another example. See how the neutral it goes to what they call ground, but you'll notice that ground goes to the common. So there's 120 volts here, 120 volts here, and between that there's 120 volts on the ground. From, any, from either the white or the or the black. So when you're when you've got a ground, you touch even the even even you touch the, even the wire that's, that's not called hot. You're going to get poked. Keep that in mind. That's why you turn off the power. Okay, other types of uh, problems. Safety. Lightning. Lightning's an interesting fellow. First of all, I'm going to tell you something that a lot of you probably never thought about or maybe you know most people do not know this lightning does not come out of the sky okay it does not come from the sky to the ground it goes from the ground up now everybody says okay i can see it coming down it's like a big spear and it comes down to the ground like so in all the movies you see it come down bang in the cartoons it always does this but no when you think about it, if you think about electricity, what's happening is that pinpoint at the end is where the charge starts to bleed into the atmosphere. As it begins to bleed, it gets wider. So the further away from the ground, the more wider. Therefore, it's coming from the pinpoint at the bottom, going up into the sky and discharging into the, into the, sky, into the sky. So lightning does not go, come down from the sky, it goes up from the ground. It's very important to understand lightning protection. Once the current is flowing, there is no protection from lightning. Voltages are astronomical. The idea, like any electrical problem, is to be able to predict or control that bleed off. What you're dealing with is a potential difference between the sky and the ground. The sky is charged with positive ions. The ground has your, your negative electrons. At some point, the potential difference between those negative electrons in the ground and the positive ions in the sky is going to reach a point where the electrons are going to be able to jump up to discharge into those positive ions. Until it reaches that point, we're building up a potential. Lightning protection controls this buildup by keeping a constant drain on this so it doesn't build up. Yes? Like a pressure valve. Yes, exactly. Yes. So all lightning protection is built, a lot, uh, built around the idea of slowly and constantly draining away that potential difference so that it never reaches the point where it wants to jump the gap. It'll wait in line and just discharge. If you look at your typical old Gothic barns, what do you see? See the old lightning rod. Are they always sharpened to a point? Yeah. Guess why? Focus. Focus it, yes. To control the charge, just to bleed it off just a little bit. Because if it was like this, when it does go, there'll be such a discharge, it'll just melt down. And that's what can happen. So the sharpened point, very important for your discharge point on lightning. So, what you want to do with, a, with your, have your antenna system is you want to encourage the lightning to bleed off slowly into the atmosphere. 
as opposed to suddenly jumping and destroying your antenna system and causing multiple current surges and affecting everything around, which is essentially what they call a lightning strike. The way we do that is that we ground the significant structure that grounds our antenna system. But you have your transmitters. They're sitting around in your receivers and all your other different, different stuff. And they just plug into your AC outlets. And they have a ground on them too. And there's that little bit of that ground there too and all that's there. But to get to that ground, it's got to go through all this wire and through the transformer and everything else. So there's a fair amount of resistance here compared to here. So what we do is we make a proper station ground system. We'll have a bar or a common tie point, And then we'll run an individual wire to each transmitter ground or receiver. It will not do this. This does not work. It's going to get you in trouble. Okay? Don't do this. That doesn't work. That's called daisy chain. Never do that. Have a common solid point. Give each one it's a separate ground and run one single line to match your ground. You should only have one station ground. It should be common. You should try and keep the distance as short as possible. You do not want to connect this to a cold water pipe because that creates a ground loop. And what can happen then is you're going to have interference created and other, other problems and you just don't want to do that. So a smart amateur, if you're going to put a ground in, do it this way. If you can't put a ground in, sometimes you're better off not to put a ground in, like an apartment building. Don't connect the ground to the cold water pipe in the apartment because you're basically transmitting into everybody house from that point on. Because by the time it gets down there, it's like one big long antenna. You're going to create problems that will never go away, even after you get rid of your radio. Everybody so, understand that? No, I don't. So do you disconnect the, the ground coming from the hydro? No, you can leave that. Leave that, you leave well. that on. That's part of the circuit. Because it's going to be on your radio. But too. on the back of your radios, you'll find a lug. They all the have lugs on them. It's a ground yeah. lug. And that's what it's for, for station ground. So ch chassis ground. Correct yes. me wrong, you're actually adding another ground. Yes, you are. To the one that's already put on the bottom. Right? Yeah, you're adding a ground to the to the yeah. electrical ground. Okay. You don't want your transmitter to be grounded in electrical ground because yeah. when you do that, uh, some of the radio frequency can travel along that wire and get into other equipment and cause other problems as well. Creating yeah. another ground with problem. So we call it bonding. Bond, yeah, you could take and your you bonding. Because there's a difference between the ground wire mm -hmm. and, and a bonding conductor. Yes. See what we do is we bond to the grounding. Yeah, same idea. Yeah. So this has no potential. So, so this ground does. So are the chassis floating until you put that ground in? Are they're you, they're floating. Uh, they're never. They're, they're not connected uh, to uh, to hydro at all. The chassis of the, of the equipment. Depending on the age of the equipment. If the chassis is hot, it's hot. Okay. And uh, would, how would the ground rod? Is it going to be an eight-foot ground rod? Eight-foot minimum. Ten is ideal. Okay. And what you do not want to do, and some people have done this, and it will cause you a lot of trouble. Looking up from the sky, down from the sky, to a typical antenna installation. Here's your concrete block, and here's your tower. And some guy decides he's going to embed his, gr his ground rod into the concrete so it will never get pulled out. Right Here's what's going to happen. And it has happened. You're going to get hit by lightning. All the concrete around this is going to explode. And down comes the tower. <laughs> and it's happened. Do not do this. So is one ground, ground rod sufficient for the tower? Yes. You, don't want, you only want one. As soon as you do more than one, you're creating another ground loop. And, and, do, you, and do you actually bond the whole three, like if it's three uh, tubes, do you bond the three tubes together? Tubes? The ground wire? Well, if, uh, a tower, right? It's got three Yeah, three well, legs. if they're bonded already, it's okay. But yes, in a, tip, in, 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 a, in a properly done system, really well done system, where they're using towers that are actually held together by bolts, 
section yeah. and so on. It's a good idea to actually fasten. Go, get all three, bond all, all three no, of them. No, basically yeah. run a separate wire from each one. Yeah. Don't okay. do this. That's daisy chaining again. So you run a separate wire, all connected to the same tie point. You run your line in from your station ground to here. That is a good ground. That will bleed away the charges. Perfect. Nicely. However, in the event of a lightning strike, some of it might get in enough to blow the front end of your receiver. Now, if you're, you're, you're really careful and you always keep your equipment disconnected during lightning storms, chances are that won't happen. But there's another effect caused by static, particularly in snowstorms. The snow running across your antenna can actually create enough static to fry the finals on or the, the uh, solid state uh, um, receiver in your radio. So that can do it as well. There is a way to protect this. Several different versions of it. This is one that's called a blitz bug. This is a special connector that goes in line. You actually want to put it close to where your, your coax goes out of your house. You don't really want it at your radio because you want to keep it as far as possible. This is kind of like a feed through. Uh, and it has a tie off point for ground. So every one of your feed lines that comes into your, your house, the actual coax, put this in series with it. And then run a line. So you have your feed line coming into your house. You know, and you have your little blitz bug. And you just run a line from that out to your common pipe point again. That way, those small charges will get bled off before they get into destroy your receiver. They're cheap and it's a smart thing to do in a proper system. Then you're really well protected. You put it inside, inside the, or outside? It should be outside because they're not really weatherproof. Inside, you're saying? Right? Inside the house. Yeah, 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 just okay. just inside okay. where it comes in, like yeah. away from okay. your radios. Yeah. Because okay. you don't want it too close to your radios anyway because it's mm -hmm. just, you know. But get it away from your radios so that the charge gets bled off before it gets up to your radios. And they're fairly effective. They're inexpensive. They're called blitz bugs. There's several different versions of them. And they're all on the same line. It's an inline, inline lightning arrestor. Radio antenna systems. Putting them up, working on them, safety, very important. If you fall from a tower, you can be seriously injured or killed. Make sure you know what you're doing and you've got the proper safety equipment. Climbing equipment is very, very highly advised. Yes? And, uh, I can give you a first time experience. My brother-in-law, B3MOE, was putting up a tower on field day, 24 feet in the air, and he was tied off. And the tower collapsed. Okay, it wasn't his fault, but the tower did collapse. Fell on top of him, and he hit the ground. Shattered his pelvis into like a number of pieces. Broke his arm. Uh, shattered his collarbone and everything else. And he'll tell you about it, dude. He's got pictures to show you. It's, it's pretty bad. And he did have a safety line here. Yeah. That, was, that would be the, the problem the tower wasn't properly secured. Yes, exactly. And we're going to talk about that. Um, so you're building a tower. They're typically seven sections at a time. So you put your first section in. Most people then they hoist up the next one and so on and so forth. Don't go too far up without getting some guidelines on it. Don't be the dummy that keeps quitting section after section after section. It'll be a problem. Okay? As soon as you get it where it should be, put your guidelines on it. Same thing if you're going to take a tower down, you're going to climb up, or climb up it or whatever, make sure guy lines are solid. You go up, take your first set of guy lines off, don't take all the guy lines off at once. First set off, down, just do it methodically. Very important to remember that. Uh, antennas, they are metal. They conduct electricity. There are two ways that you can get clobbered by electricity from an antenna. One is by direct connection, the other is by um, induction. The first one is pretty obvious, 
if you put a power, an antenna near a power line and it comes through it, somebody's going to get hurt. Don't put antennas above power lines. When they fall, they'll cross the power line. If you're going to put up dipole antennas in that, put them under the power line. Yes, you're going to get a little bit less signal, but you're going to be alive to play with your radios. <laughs> and that's all the response. Yes. Because when those antennas fall down and they sooner or later they just might do that, uh, you don't want that power getting back into your antenna, into your radios or whatever. It could kill you or members of your family or neighbors or whatever. So just don't do it. Stay away from things. When you're putting up antennas and things, be aware of your power lines. Make sure that if possible, that even if the thing came down, there's no way it's going to touch the power line. If there is a possibility that when it comes down, it's going to touch a power line, be extra careful that it's well secured and that you're fully aware of what this thing is, ha what's happening all the time. Um, induction, very interesting story. Years ago, when I was playing with the CD bands, uh, we had a person who had a radio and he could not keep a receiver working in it. No matter what radio he plugged into his antenna, within a 10 to 15 minutes, he had no receiver. And he'd take it back and he'd say the receiver's blowing. Nobody could figure out what it was. So they called me in. So I started looking around and said, well, okay, there has to be a reason, something going on here. So I looked around and I noticed that his antenna was very close to some high tension power lines. I thought, hmm, that's interesting. So as I was taking the coax off the radio, I saw a spark jump as I just made the dis as I disconnected it. I then took out my voltmeter and I measured 90 volts AC between the center of the mm -hmm. coax and the shield. So guess what? The, by induction, the antenna was acting like a transformer. It was picking up enough voltage to put 90 volts AC on the line. You put that into a MOSFET on any receiver and it's gone very quick. So what was the solution? Well, yes, you can move, I should recommend that he move the antenna, but there's also, there's another thing you could have put done a, too. Put a load on it, drain it. Well, a filter. Yeah. Drain off the, yeah. drain off the, yeah. the uh, put a, an AC, a 60 hertz uh, um, grounded filter to dra mm -hmm. drain it. But ideally, get it away from the power lines. <laughs> so it can happen. Kind of like a, a, an, in, an enhanced version of snow static. Yeah, there could possibly be a shock there too. You're, you're absolutely right. And that would be because the whole antenna system was not... Grounded? <laughs> Another possible solution. And maybe it's a cheap way to get uh, power at no cost. <laughs> <laughs> so there are all kinds of ways... There'd be no room for You wouldn't be able to lay the ball. To do grounding. So there's some really neat ways. I'm just going to give you some quick examples of uh, types of grounding systems. Um, here's a simple self coax speed grounding system. All they did is wrap a wire around the coax at a certain point and the, and the line as it goes into the before it goes into the house and run it to a ground state. That work. It's like a blitz plug. That work. You want to cover this up with tape, of course. You know, that, but, you know. There's a simple idea. That's essentially what a blitz plug is. That's one method they could do. Hems are very inventive, you know, they don't always buy stuff. Here's your blitz bug I was telling you about. Closer look at it. Uh, let's see. Same thing, a little bit more. Just in this case, they didn't want to cut the line, they just put in a little coupler and used the two PL 259s and they did the same thing. That's why they didn't damage the coax. It's another way to do it. Uh, this is more of the professional method of doing things. This is, this is, this is a, the, your, your deluxe ham shack. They put a bulkhead connector in right where it comes into the house. This is all grounded. All their connections are connected to it. And then this is run right to your, to your station ground. A giant let's bug. 
that's the more elaborate method of doing things. That's uh, just to take care of static? Yep, static and, and, light, and lightning protection. Uh, here's another system. Their coax switches themselves are connected to a solid piece of copper. And all their coax lines come in, switching, everything was all grounded. These are the individual lines going to each particular equipment in the station. And then they have their master ground wire that goes out. Also, I should mention that the best conducting wire for in the case of a grounding system is a piece of flat braid. It's better than a solid piece of wire. Highly recommended. And that's for grounding? Yes, for the actual grounding. It's, it's, it's actually better. For different characteristics, it's much better. Um, Here's another device. In this case, this is designed for like a cable TV system. It's basically a solid piece of metal with uh, another a piece of metal that goes in that's insulated from the outside. You put your two F connectors on it, and this goes to uh, your ground. That's a static or lightning arresting type system for grounding the system. There's all kinds of ways to do it. Uh, here's one. The guy decided to just mount it to the house. This is a this is a, a larger version, using the, uh, the the bigger connectors. Same idea. Here's another one, where they use uh, similar devices again, uh, with the bar outside the house. This one is a, a spark gap device using ladder line. And you talk about different types of feed line. These are two, two pieces of wire that are uh, separated by an insulator. And they call it like ladder line. And they use it for certain types of antennas. And they can be used as feed line. It's low loss. It's not coaxial. It's a, it's a balanced line. And you see what they've done here is they've run a ground wire to a piece of bent metal. And they have two little uh, isolated points here. And they've adjusted this gap so that it just sits just above it. So that when the potential builds up to a certain point, it'll jump the gap and discharge the static. Sounds are very inventive. Here's the typical thing I was explaining to you again. Uh, in this case, they decided to use coax. This prevents any possibility of any RF propagating along the line. So they will run their, their line to the common ground, but the line itself will be shielded. And they'll use the center line of the coax to be the, uh, to be the line. Up. This would be used when you, want to, when you have no choice and you've got to run a long line to get to your ground. This is another way to get around in an apartment situation or something. You could use RG8 coax and use the center line for your ground and then ground the outside shield as well and it could possibly stop the radiation problem. There are ways of ground problems. This is an example of a ground loop. This is why you don't want to daisy chain and have other ways for, the, for, the, for them to interact. Every one of these could possibly interact with each other because there's two grounds, two connections. This prevents that because they're all to one point. They can't interact with each other. When they try to do this, it's all going to be along the common bus line. It's going to take the shorter distance to, to, to real ground. But if you were to just do this and take this off, like some people have actually done, and said, well, it's a ground line, so I just make a common to my receiver, and I have a nice closed system. Eh? They draw all the same potential, it would be great. Well, no, no. Now you've got a ground loop. There's more chance of problems. You're feeding your transmitter into your receiver. Probably blow it the first time you transmit. Mm -hmm. Can't go halfway. Here's a, a multi multiple uh, system that the guy's created. He's put them right on the ground rod. He 
feeds his coax through. This is just showing you the importance of a single point ground. Uh, yeah, I didn't make that clear in my picture. I actually do that wrong. You're not doing this. You're actually running a separate line from each unit to the same bolt on the ground plane. So it goes to the same bolt. In this case, just being on the wrong bolt can create ground loop. Keep them all together, mask in one spot, and then one point to ground. That's, that's the proper way to do a station ground. Then you don't get any ground loops. This is another version. This one's a little more advanced. This uses a gas discharge device. It has a little tube in here. And what happens is when the voltage gets to a certain point, the, uh, the gas ignites and creates uh, a, a path right off the center of the, ca of the cable itself. This protects the center and the outside. And the cartridges are usually uh, replaceable. That's what I have at my station. Here's an example of a proper of a tower ground. Notice how they got all the lines. They're all going to tie to one spot. And that spot is, see how the lines are all somewhere over here. And actually, it's, no, it's not there. It's, it's one stake. And you notice it. I, I don't particularly like this. These are too close to the cement because of the reason I mentioned. I would keep those a little further, further away. But he's got the generally the right idea here. That's about all I have. Any questions? OK, well, yeah. thank you. You've been a wonderful Actually, audience. <laughs> Actually, before yes. you close up. Yes. About your 